What? Oh. Is the introduction of Christine Blackledge. Christine Blackledge earned her MSA in International Business Administration from Central Michigan University and her Master of Public Health and Master of Science in Food Safety from Michigan State University. Along with certificate in HACCP and International Food Laws and Regulations. She comes from an agricultural background and has traveled around the world independently and with USAID to build food safety cultures from farm to kitchen. She draws from all available resources to coordinate and facilitate programs and services from a comprehensive approach. She is skilled at translating complex technical concepts into innovative and coherent messages that resonate. Her expertise has helped farmers, processors, and governments improve their food safety and increase food export opportunities. This is the introduction of Christine Blackledge. Thank you. Okay. Hi, hi everybody. Hi everybody. This is Melinda from Wind Conferences. I'm the host of this Wind Conferences. Welcome. Our speaker, Christian Blacklet. Hi, Christian. How are you? I'm not quite sure how I get my PowerPoint up here. Um, Just click on this uh, arrow mark. Okay, okay, so we got this, we got the video, we have audio settings. Any idea how I get the PowerPoint to share? Yes, click on this arrow button. Can you see the arrow button? I see HD, switch bandwidth. I see no, 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 not that. Before that, you can see this uh, video mic and after that you can see the yes. arrow button okay okay just click on Share that screen yeah. let's find a window okay is it sharing now yes is that working Yes, it's working. You can go ahead and start your session. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, this is the first time I've ever used this software, so I apologize. Um, I welcome everyone. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I'm a little surprised. I'm a half hour early, so <laughs> I'm a little um, ditz here. So anyway, I have a Master's of International Business Administration as well as a master's in public health and a master's in food safety. My certificates are in food laws and regulations and in HACCP. So I started doing this about 12 years ago 
Um, I've worked um, throughout the world. The first time I went was in Cameroon. And it was a very eye opener because one of the things you find out when you go into another culture is the differences and how what you take for granted isn't always the same in another culture. In this situation, I was trying to reach some young farmers that were out in the rainforest and we had a hard time getting a hold of them. And one night after we had kind of closed up shop and and push the tables in front of the doors for the night. I heard these motorcycles come and all of a sudden there was pounding on the door and a bunch of talking and we're in kind of the slums of Rwanda, Cameroon. And this wasn't something that you took lightly when somebody started pounding on the door. So pretty soon Celestine came into the bedroom and asked me if I would get up and teach some young farmers who had finally showed up at about one o'clock in the morning. So I said, sure, I'll get that. So I got my tablet out, got ready, went in to talk to them. And um, I wasn't quite sure where to begin because I didn't know for sure how many could even understand me because of the language differences and how much they actually knew. So I drew a seed and pretty soon I sprouted the seed and I had primary root and primary leaf. And then I did secondary leaves and went from the tap root to the secondary roots. And they all were very, you know, watching me very closely. And so then I started talking about the nutrients that were in the soil. And most farmers are, you know, somewhat knowledgeable of the fertilizers um, that we use most prominently, which is the NPK. So I started telling them how nitrogen was for growth and phosphorus was for the energy needs and the roots and how potassium allowed photosynthesis and the absorption of water and calcium helps the plant grow strong. And so then I started going into the absorption of the micronutrients and how magnesium keeps the dark colors. And when the leaves go yellow, you know, you don't have enough magnesium. And all of a sudden the room just erupted into conversation. And I felt kind of concerned, like perhaps I had upset them. I had made a wrong assumption. Maybe I embarrassed them or um, I was being way too simplistic. So I was concerned. I didn't want to start off on a bad foot and finally things calmed down. And Celestine said to me, these young farmers who came from farm families of multiple generations wanted to know how come no one had ever told them this before. And I was stunned that they didn't know the basics biology of growing plants. And I think they're not alone in every day. We are constantly being faced with information that we know nothing about. Farmers are pretty much the same and food processors are the same around the world. Um, I go around, I've been to 13 African countries, the Middle East, um, Latin America mostly. And every time I go, there's new questions to be asked. How do we keep food safe? Even the FAO has come out with the thinking about the future of food safety. This is something that all agricultural organizations from the national to the international to the local farmer have been thinking about. We have a very complex production and distribution system for our food. And we have multiple countries of origin, multiple farms that we're getting products from, and then we're exporting to multiple countries, secondary processors and different consumers in different forms. Let's see if I can get this to go. <laughs> So we need to ensure proper hygiene along the entire production chain to prevent problems that constantly arrange. This is from Ireland, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland lets me use this. And it's a good example of how in just one pizza, there can be 35 ingredients from 60 countries on five continents. And just because you buy that pizza today and you identify where those ingredients come from, if you buy it next week, chances are those 35 ingredients are coming from different countries 
because people buy for their businesses based on price and availability. So it's never constant and it's always changing. And so keeping the food safe that we are eating is a difficult task to have. Even in the sustainable uh, development goals that we are all driving towards, we understand that food safety is a central part of the agri-food systems. But how do we do this? Well, one of the way is through Codex Alimentarius, which is the international food law. It has the standards that cover all the basic food types, whether they be raw, semi-processed or processed that are distributed to consumers. The regulations of Codex refer to food hygiene and quality, including the microbiology standards, food additives, pesticide residues, methods for sampling and hazard analysis, food imports and exports, certification systems. This is a joint venture between FAO and WHO to formulate internationally accepted food safety standards that protect human health and ensure fair trade. It's important, this scorecard of what we're going to look at of Codex Alimentarius, because when it comes to international trade, it's Codex that stands, sets the standards. Every nation has its own food safety standards, but when it comes to trade, Codex Alimentarius is the judge. In our food production chain, we can have contamination anywhere in that chain, from production to processing to distribution to preparations. But there are nine foods that are most likely to cause food poisoning, we've decided. Food can become contaminated at any point during the production or the preparation. Vegetables carry diseases all the way from the farm to your table. And most outbreaks come from salmonella, which occurs when protose isn't cleaned properly, or E. coli when it's a result of undercooked animal products, or else it has come into the water and it's gotten on the plants, or there's been wild animals or domestic animals that might come into a field and spread the E. coli. Listeria, which causes miscarriages, and hepatitis A, and a whole host of others, uh, illness, illnesses that can be contracted through food. So it's a complex web, but everything is connected. Animals, like people, carry germs in their guts, including antibiotic-resistant germs. And the food supply in the U.S. is one of the safest in the world, but people still get sick. We can't control it 100% of the time. It depends on there's pesticides um, that's put on to manage crop diseases. There's storm water and runoff that runs into the rivers and the lakes that we use for irrigation and contaminates the soil. When animals are slaughtered, there's germs in them that can um, contaminate the meat as it's sold if it's not cooked properly. People get sick from contaminated food or from contact with animals and the, and the surroundings. Antibiotics save life, but antibiotics used to extreme can contribute to the antibiotic resistance that a lot of people, including myself, have fought with. Animal waste carries traces of previously consumed antibiotics. And foods such as fruits and vegetables can become contaminated through contact of the soil, the water, or waste from animals. So even examples of contamination in pro production, if a hen's productive organs are infected, the yolk of the egg can be contaminated before it's even laid. If fields are sprayed with contaminated water for irrigation, fruits and vegetables can be contaminated before harvest. Fish in some tropical reefs may acquire a toxin from smaller sea creatures that they eat. Contaminants such as heavy metals, chemicals, PCBs, they can all be in the soil and taken up by the crop plants during the growth. Agricultural contaminants include nutrients, pesticides, animal waste. Even if a worker stays on the job while they're sick, and does not wash their hands carefully after using the toilet, the worker can spread germs by just touching the food as he's picking it. But food contamination starts in the soil. 
We don't always think about this. We think of it in the processing plant where things might be unsanitary or it's not cleaned adequately. And so we have HACCP that we have put in place for processing, but contaminants start way before that. Um, the contaminants that are taken up by the plants is a root of dietary exposure to contaminants. Small amounts of arsenic and catamon are present all over the globe and can be detected in many food products. It's a concentration in vegetables and fruits. There are many countries who have so much arsenic in their fields where their apples are grown that the apples can't be consumed by the public unless they are changed in some way to protect us. The chemical form of the element, how much of it someone eats, determines the individual experiences as a negative health effect. Consuming low doses over a long period of time can cause cancer. So we can say a field has a small dosage and so it's not really important. But the fact is if people are eating it every day, say like in rice, um, that accumulates within their bodies. So it's not only how the food is grown, it's the concentration of the contaminant and where the contaminants are stored within the food. Changing the soil environment can help control the chemical forms and plant uptake of the contaminants in the soil, such as we have found with rice that we can add the rice husk to the field and it will help absorb some of these contaminants. Some of the, say, arsenic, if you have more water, it causes more contamination, or cadmium, when you have less water, causes more contamination. So how you grow a plant in the contamination also makes a part. Health and welfare of food producing animals. These diseases are tr transmitted by hu to humans by animals, including through food. About 75% of the new diseases that affected humans since 2000 have originated from animals or products of animal or origin. We all know about COVID, we all know about monkeypox, we all know about these diseases that have crossed the barriers from animals to humans. The presence of bacteria like salmonella and campylobacteria that when present in animals can infect food. Antibiotic use in animals and agriculture can lead to antibiotic resistance in bacteria that can spread to humans and other animals through direct contact or contaminated food. Food safety considerations include origins of the food, including the practices relating to food labeling, food hygiene, food additives, and pesticide residues. The 2015 WHO or World Health Organization report on the estimates of the global burden of foodborne diseases presented the first ever estimates of disease burden caused by 31 foodborne agents at the global and sub-regional level, highlighting that more than 600 million cases of foodborne illnesses and 420,000 deaths can occur each year. So there's a cost of food safety. Is it better for correction or is it better for prevention? A private study was done to see how many food facilities could pass a basic good agricultural practice, GAP, or good manufacturing practices, GMP, audit. It was discovered that less than 20% of these companies would be able to pass the most basic food safety audit. Prevention is an investment up front, but in the end, it helps reduce risk and cost. Food safety prevention is an ongoing journey of understanding your many risks and implementing procedures and processes to minimize these risks. The cost of correction technology and the infrastructure needed can be prohibitive. Most of our food is grown by small family farms. Family farms produce about 80% of the world's food that actually goes to feeding people. Most 84% of the world's 570 million farms are small holding. That is farms that are less than two hectares in size. 
in size. Many smallholder farmers are some of the poorest people in the world. So you have to start thinking, what can they afford to do for correction? Or is it better to start telling them about prevention? Small scale food processors, processors exist throughout the world and are exporting to everyone. Small food manufacturers face regulatory challenge and food safety testings on very small budgets. FAO, Unidu, and others offer reference manuals that outline practices and procedures for the production of safe processed products and for de development of good hygienic practices and good manufacturing practices. Programs that will serve as the foundation for the preparation of a hazard analysis and critical control point system, HASA. Sector HISAP. This is something new that we started talking about. The application of HISAP to begin with had to do with processing, something that we came across with our, um, with, through our military actually, when we started going out into outer space. But this can be applied to any sector of the food chain. And that sector should be operating according to the Codex General Principles of Food Hygiene, the appropriate food uh, codex, code, codex codes of practice and appropriate food safety legislation. The Codex guidelines defined a critical control point as a step at which control can be applied and is essential to prevent or eliminate a food safety hazard or reduce it to acceptable. That's something like we talked about with the rice, with putting the rice husk in the field, and it helps absorb some of the contaminants so that the plant doesn't absorb all the contaminant. That would be a critical control point and something we could do to prevent or eliminate the food safety hazard or reduce it to at least acceptable so that it wasn't causing illness. Hazard analysis and critical control points is the most internationally recognized system based on production of safe food from a preventive approach. And it's not just for processors. The benefits of HISAP is that it is a cost-effective system for the control of food safety from the ingredients right through to the production, storage, and distribution, then the sale and the service to the final consumer. The preventive approach of HISAP-based procedures not only improves food safety management, but also complements other quality management systems. So the main benefits of HISAP based on procedures are that it saves your business money in the long run. It avoids poisoning your customers. Food safety standards are increased. It ensures that you're compliant with the law. Food quality standards are increased. It organizes your process to produce safe food. It organizes your staff promoting teamwork and efficiency. And it gives you due diligence defense if you ever have to be held in a court. The principles of HISAP. A food safety management system based on the principle of HISAP will enable hazards to be identified and controlled before they threaten the safety of the food and your customers. So it's pretty simple. There are always seven basic principles. You identify what the hazard is. Now, that doesn't matter if you're in the field where you grow it, if it's when you're picking the food and it, fresh fruits and vegetables. It doesn't matter if you're loading it on a truck and transporting it. It doesn't matter if you're processing that food for either sale or for shipment or for further processing. You determine the critical control points. Where could the food become contaminated? You establish the critical limits. Okay, we know that it only can have so high of a limit of certain contaminants, or it might be zero. There's a control point. E. coli, is it metal? Is it a pesticide? Is it an herbicide? Um, you know, what is it that you need to monitor? 
you establish the corrective action to be taken when monitoring indicates that a particular CCP is not under control. So you've got fresh fruits and vegetables, find out you've got some E. coli. You have to figure out where did that E. coli come from? Did it come from the water? Did it come from animals getting into the field? Um, did it come from the people who were picking it? Um, where is it coming from and what corrective action needs to be taken so that you can keep it under control? What are the procedures that you can establish for verification that it's working? Can you test it? Can you um, wash it? Can you, what do you need to do? And then establish the documentation that concerns all the procedures and records appropriately these principles and how you are applying them. So there are three basic types of hazards. There's microbiology, um, biological hazards, that's your bacteria, your yeast, your molds, your viruses, your chemical hazards. Chemical hazards include water, food contact materials, cleaning agents, pest control substances, just contaminants in the environment, the agricultural processes, pesticides, biocides, and food additives. There's also physical hazards, glass. Can something break and get into the food? The packaging that you're putting in it, is it safe for human consumption if some of the package leaches into the food itself? What about the jewelry that our people are wearing? Could it drop into the processor and get chopped up and become part of the food? What about the pest? Do, are there rats? Are there mice? Are there flies? Are there screws or parts of the machinery that can come apart and get into food? So prevention instead of correction, the FDA implements a, a new system for food safety regulation. At the heart of the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act, which we call FIMSMA, lies in food safety regulations that require the food industry to implement hazard analysis and risk-based preventive control measures at food facilities. The FDA became law in January 2011 with the primary intent of redirecting the country's food safety regulatory regime to a system that identifies and prevents hazards in the food supply chain instead of being a reactionary system based largely on enforcement and punishment. Just recently, we have two generic hazard analysis and critical control point models for raw catfish products that have just recently been released by the USDA Food Safety and Inspection Service. One model demonstrates the process of farm-raised catfish, and another model illustrates the process of wild-caught catfish. While the model's critical control points do not necessarily apply to operations or products, they may serve as a starting point for similar products. The flow diagrams demonstrate general production process and should be modified to reflect the processes used at each establishment. The food safety critical limits selected must come from scientific documents or other reliable sources. These models include references for guidance on the selection of critical limits. So this is very new and we can see that even the USDA is heading towards prevention instead of punishment later. Food producers can safely grow food and vegetables using the WHO five keys to growing safer foods and vegetables. To decrease the burden of foodborne diseases, the WHO develops risk assessment, recommends risk management options, and translates complex scientific knowledge into simple risk communication messages for stakeholders. Education in food safety goes far beyond its goals. The adoption of effective food safety behaviors when growing and handling fruits and vegetables will have an impact on overall hygienic behaviors, which will contribute to improve community health and ultimately aid in achieving the UN Millennium Development Goals that aim to reduce poverty, empower women, 
reduce child mortality and improve access to basic sanitation. The Food and Drug FDA has a strict new food traceability rule that is set to become official on November 7th. There are high risk foods implicated in foodborne illnesses. These are cheeses, soft cheeses, crustaceans, cucumbers, thin fish, fresh herbs, vegetables, and fruits, green nuts, nut butters, peppers, ready to eat deli salads, shell eggs from domestic domesticated hens, sprouts, tomatoes, and tropical fruit tree fruits, the things that all of us buy at the grocery store every week. So I want to say thank you to, to each and every one of you. And I hope you'll think about the next time that you're working or picking up your food, whether you're in your kitchen, making it up into a meal, or whether you're going through the store, picking it up, that food safety is important and it's part of everybody's job to keep it right. Now, all food that comes into our country is not here because, or it's not rejected because there's something wrong with it. Sometimes it's nothing more than the label. And that's what I have been doing a lot of lately is going to countries um, like Lebanon and some Guatemala, um, trying to get them to help them with their labeling. Probably 90% of the food that's rejected at the at the um, borders of both the EU and the US is because of labeling. There is a thought that if you can't get the label right, then the food probably isn't right. Not going to say it's fair, I didn't make the rules. My job is to go and help people figure out how to fix that so that they can import safely with safe food. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity and I thank you to listen. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Christine, for the very wonderful information about the international food packaging from the farm to the kitchen. So, so here is the question from our audience. The question is, so how does HACCP compare to the current food production and inspection programs? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. How does HACCP compare to the current food production and inspection programs? HACCP is something currently that's used in processing. And it's about making sure that the processing plant is clean and that all the methods that are used there do not introduce any contamination or cross-contamination of the food. This on sector high sap has to do with going on each step of the food production from the growing of food in the but from How can the buyer who then transports it and the gets to the processor? Um, sorry, I'm still there? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. We cannot hear you. I had a little message that said maybe we were interrupted. We cannot hear you. You 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 have some network issues. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not quite sure why. Since my audio is on. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. So are there any other questions? Uh, yes, no, 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 far. so far no questions. Thank you so much for the uh, great information you have shared with us. 
so thank you so much for being a part of this very conference as a speaker so so thank you so much for all the wonderful ladies who have attended this conference so wonderful presentations it's really beautiful thank you so much it's it's, it's really great and bye bye thank you